Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on with Doomsday Clock? I want to talk about talk about Doomsday Clock. And in reality, I don't even know if anybody cares about this anymore. Because the, the, the truth of Doomsday Clock is you're talking about a story that's taken three years, essentially, to finish. And at the time that it was introduced, right? For those of you guys who, who aren't really reading DC at the moment or who have never read DC Comics, at the time that Doomsday Clock was introduced, that is to say, like, they were going to go forward with the Doomsday Clock story, the biggest interest people had was Dr. Manhattan, right? You have this guy with an insane amount of power, and everybody wanted to know how he stacked up, right? That was the big question people had. How does Dr. Manhattan stack up against some of the big heavy hitters in DC Comics? At the end of the day, that's what we want to know, right? I mean, the story's cool and everything, but, like, we want to know. Like, what would happen if, like, the Spectre fought Dr. Manhattan? <laughs> You know, what, what would happen if these two characters fought? You know, if like Dr. Fate met Dr. Manhattan, you know, like how, how would that whole thing go down? That's what we want to see. That's the conflict we want to see. Like if DC started releasing a series of one shots, you know, like Dr. Manhattan versus Dr. Fate, Dr. Manhattan versus like Superman 1 million, Dr. Manhattan versus Superboy Prime, dude, those things would sell like gangbusters. <laughs> They would sell out so bad. I could make those videos on my YouTube channel and they would explode, right? A million views each. I mean, people want to see that. Like, people want to see that kind of stuff. Because Dr. Manhattan, you know, much like Galactus, the Galactus, uh, Galactus discussion a second ago, is this being with just, like, an insurmountable amount of power. And you guys were, you guys remember, you know, a lot of the theories that were going around at the time, right? This idea that, like, Dr. Manhattan is the reason why the new 52 exists, right? You know, that, that you had Barry Allen who went back in time to save his mom's life and ended up creating the Flashpoint universe as a result. And so we had to basically go back in time and let her die. And when he did that, Dr. Manhattan stepped in and changed things. Uh, we, we, we saw like all these little, these little, you know, or at least had all these little theories on everything that Dr. Manhattan's done over the course of his time in the DC universe to mess things up. A lot of the Doomsday Clock story has rectified that, right? So the reason why the Justice Society of America doesn't exist is because at the moment when Alan Scott was supposed to discover the Green Lantern and then become a superhero, that the Green Lantern was moved slightly out of his reach. And so the result was that he ended up being hit by the train and instead of actually getting the Green Lantern itself. And the result was that there was no Alan Scott Green Lantern, meaning there was no formation of the Justice Society of America, hence the reason it doesn't exist. You know, it was, it was cool, you know, to see those little, those little tidbits thrown in, those little tidbits introduced. But uh, the reality of this is that with regards to, to how we stand right now on Doomsday Clock, you're looking at a situation where a lot of people are just kind of like, okay, so like, it's a story that exists. And I think that DC's really felt that, right? I think that, that in the time that Doomsday Clock has not been, uh, has, has really been been kind of, you know, staged out, right? Basically delayed. You know, in, in the time that that's happened, I think that DC's lost a lot of the momentum they had. And it kind of sucks to see, right? Because a lot of people were looking at Doomsday Clock and they were saying, okay, so everything that happens after Doomsday Clock is going to be a result of like whatever Manhattan did, right? Like Manhattan changes everything back. So, you know, or he does this or he does that or wipes his character out of existence. Or maybe it's a, you know, blackest night, brightest day kind of thing where like he just resurrects all these different characters and then chooses which ones get to stay. You know, whatever the case happened to be, a lot of people were looking at the post Doomsday Clock landscape, which really should have concluded about a year and a half, I think maybe even two years ago and then said okay so like you know everything that comes after this is going to be really really awesome and instead they're, they're kind of looking at doomsday clock and then they look at a lot of things like you're the villain they look at all these different stories heroes in crisis which as much as i enjoyed it wasn't the most well-received story by by hardcore comic book fans uh they, they look at a lot of these things and they're kind of like so where is this going like what's the point of this like like is it really just a series of successive stories and if it is let us know but like what it seems right now is you're building up to a big event but i thought this big event was supposed to come off the coattails of doomsday clock now is it going to come off the coattails and, and what's going on with Scott Snyder's Justice League? Like, what's going on here? And so I think that in the confusion and with a lot of stuff kind of up in the air, people not really sure where DC is because maybe DC's not sure where, where DC is going. Uh, ultimately, I think a lot of the momentum they had coming out of coming out of DC Universe Rebirth number one has kind of been lost. And of course, that opened the door for Marvel to swoop in, especially because they hired C.B. Sobolski as editor-in-chief, who's basically a fan. And in one fell swoop, they totally took over that momentum. And now Marvel's absolutely crazy rushing it over on their side of things. But with regards to, to, to Doomsday Clock itself, you know, a lot of these theories that are going on, different things like that, there are a, a few prevailing theories that are 
really, really interesting here, right? There's, there's, there's a few, th a few theories here that are, that are, that are really, really solid. And one of these theories is, is that, that essentially the specter will intervene, right? The, the, the specter will intervene at the end of doomsday clock number 12. And this is actually a really, really cool theory. And I really dig this because one of the things that, that Jeff Johns really loves in DC comics is the old stuff, right? Jeff Johns loves the old stuff. He loves, he loves like the really old stories with the old characters, you know, with like Barry Allen back in the day. So the reason why he brought Barry Allen in, or at least, you know, had Barry Allen brought in as the new Flash when New 52 lost instead of keeping Wally West is because Jeff Johns loves Barry Allen, you know? And, and while he isn't the original Flash, I would say that for a lot of people out there, he is, right? I mean, you look at, at Jay Garrick and you say, yes, he's the original Flash, but in reality, he was more of a Flash prototype. Can this character work? And then when you go into DC Showcase number four, you get Barry Allen, who was a Flash for like 30 years, you know, 30, 30 some odd years. I want to say like 31 years or so when Crisis on Infinite Earths happened. And so you got a lot of these really, really cool stories, you know, with this, with this character. But, you know, depending on what era you're coming from, maybe you are super old hat and you really prefer the old school, old school characters. But the Spectre is about as old school as it gets, right? I mean, this guy has been around one of the, one of the very first comic book characters to be introduced by, uh, by National Allied before it even became DC Comics when it merged with All-American. And so he's super, super old school. But one of the things that we've seen with Dr. Manhattan, if we've seen him face off against magic, right? We've seen him face off against various superpowers. We saw that when he fought the Justice League, right? You know, in terms of just superpowered beings, they didn't really matter much to him. And with regards to magic, Dr. Manhattan was like, all you're doing, all you're doing is just using what's left of the universe. You're just manipulating fragments of the universe, but like, you're not doing anything that I cannot do. And you haven't done anything that I cannot overcome, right? So he was just like done. Like he just took out all the, all the magic wielders and all the superheroes at the same time. The question becomes, how would Dr. Manhattan fare against like divine power, right? The power of God, basically, because that's what the specter is. The specter is a living embodiment of God's judgment or God's wrath, whichever ver uh, version you want to go with. And so he is a supremely powerful character channeling the power of God. While he, he isn't necessarily God himself, and so far as he cannot do everything the presence can, he's still extremely capable. The ability to time travel, different things like that. And so seeing someone like the specter intervene would be intriguing. The fun thing about this though is that the specter is not the end all be all right we've seen the specter defeated by like necron you know the the walking talking embodiment or at least one of the aspects of death as it pertains to the green lantern mythos so like we've seen the specter defeated and overcome in in various iterations the question is if you're talking about somebody like dr manhattan who can manipulate matter on the atomic level then everything is composed of matter right like if it exists it's composed of matter divine or otherwise and so if the specter has a form then the specter is made of matter meaning the specter could be controlled by Dr. Manhattan, or perhaps even just discorporated, right? You know, he shows up and, and the Spectre, and then Dr. Manhattan's just like, what are you? And the Spectre is like, I'm the embodiment of God's judgment. And I judge you, you know, as being a bad guy, basically. And so now you have to go away. And Dr. Manhattan's like, no, nah, I'm good. And then just waves his hand and like, there goes the Spectre. <laughs> He's like, oh, you know, and then just kind of disappears. And then that's basically it. You know, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think that would be hilarious. I think that'd be that'd be so funny if they did that. If the Spectre's just like, you have to go, and Dr. Manhattan's like, nah, man, I'm watching Golden Girls, I'm good, and just like claps his hand and the Spectre just disappears and like this this scream, you know, basically. But there's another theory here that says that like Dr. Manhattan would revert back to John Osterman, right? This idea that, that Manhattan would get into this universe and, and, you know, by virtue of talking to Superman would essentially regain his humanity, right? Because one of the big things about Manhattan that was really a part of Alan Moore's Watchmen um, and, and really even kind of a mainstay here in Doomsday Clock because Jeff Johns was wanting to stay true to the original narrative and nature of the characters from the Watchmen stories is that once Osterman transcended and became Dr. Manhattan, he didn't care, right? He didn't really care about about people for him it was they were they were ants going about some insignificant life that wasn't really relevant to him and so as a result of that that's why he ended up leaving he was like okay whatever you know like like literally i can do pretty much anything i want to you know i can i can do all kinds of crazy stuff i've i perceive time in a way that would drive all of you insane if you saw it the same way that i do uh and you guys are squabbling over land <laughs> You guys are pointing nukes at each other because you guys are worried about, you know, capitalism versus communism. Like, I've got better things to do. Uh, it's been real and it's been good, but it ain't been real good. Peace. You know, and he would basically, you know, he basically bailed out. But but he was disconnected from his humanity. He didn't care about people. But wouldn't it be intriguing? And wouldn't it be a great kind of hail, kind of a homage to Superman? If Superman, by virtue of talking to Dr. Manhattan, even if he doesn't necessarily walk away from his godly powers, uh, assuming that he even could, but instead, somebody just kind of takes on the 
mantle of Osterman almost kind of becomes this Martian Manhunter-esque character, right? Where there's the human side and then the, the, the ultra-powerful side, you know? Or with Superman, right? There's the Clark Kent and, and Superman dichotomy. Assuming that, you know, that, assuming that that happened, it would actually be an amazing concept. The, the issue that you have with this, and this is one of the struggles that you're going to have with somebody like Manhattan, who's continually existing in the DC universe, is that you're going to have the Franklin Richards effect, right? Franklin Richards is this ultra-powerful character in comics and, and, and Marvel Comics, and the question is, well, this major event popping off and Franklin Richards can do anything, then why doesn't Franklin Richards stop it? And that's the question people are going to have when it comes to Manhattan, is if Manhattan continues to exist in the DC universe, then say like some major crisis event shows up, right? You know, some some huge thing happens, Perpetua or something like that. People are going to say, why doesn't Dr. Manhattan just stop her, right? If he can control all forms of matter, if he transcends the multiverse and he's just this ultra powerful being who is powerful enough to destroy the White Lanterns, then like, why doesn't he just stop Perpetua? Assuming that he even could, right? Now, if he could, it'd be interesting because we don't really know how Perpetua ranks in power to Dr. Manhattan because we haven't really seen Dr. Manhattan extend the full limits of what he's capable of, right? So we don't know the absolute limits of his power, right? We haven't seen him turn the entire city of Gotham into like sock puppets, right? We haven't seen him... <laughs> That'd be hilarious. We haven't seen him turn, you know, the whole of Metropolis into like teddy bears, right? You know, to, to turn the sun into a teddy bear. That'd be kind of cool, but kind of creepy at the same time. You know, like a giant teddy bear in the sky, like, you guys are doing a good job. <laughs> That'd be kind of wild and, and, and kind of crazy. But, but nonetheless, we haven't seen that kind of display of power yet. And so the question becomes, you know, if, if, if you're talking about something like that, you know, how does it compare to that sort of character? But again, I kind of want to reiterate here, that's what you would run into is people would ask the question, where's Dr. Manhattan and why hasn't he stopped it yet? Plus for future writers, it makes it too easy to end a story, right? What you don't want to do is feed future writers in such a way to where they can essentially kind of take the easy way out. It's what Brian Michael Bendis was well known for doing in, in Marvel Comics over the years. And it's one of the things that we don't really want to see happen in, in DC. I mean, granted, it wasn't a whole lot that he did, but like it was things like he created Matthew Malloy and didn't know how to write himself out of it, right? So what he did is he basically had the X-Men travel back in time and prevent Matthew Malloy from being born in order to keep his character from existing. Just different things like that. You know, it was, it was, it was kind of wild and kind of crazy. And so, you know, because of that, uh, I want to get into the final theory here. I want to get into the final theory, which I think is the most interesting one. And it was actually one that a fan sent to me, right? So for those of you guys who were, who were unfamiliar on my Instagram at I am Rob Jefferson, I live stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on Instagram and talk to you guys, right? Like I'll literally add you guys to the, to the stream. And then like, we'll go live together and just talk about things. Um, and, and, and one of the things that, that I did, I think I grabbed a kid named Nigel, I think was his name. I can't remember his name off the top my head but he had this theory about why it is a dr manhattan could not see past superman and i said okay so what's this theory that you have and he said it's because basically the speed force opens up and like all the speedsters come out and my thought was okay but like how does that have anything to do with anything and he made a made a really good point in saying that in the in the flash tv show right now which may explain why it is a series was delayed for so long but in the flash tv show right now what they basically said is inside the speed force are tachyons and tachyons of course are are you know essentially disrupt the perception of Dr. Manhattan. He can't see past them, right? It's like a giant fog, a giant kind of blanket sitting over his face. And so what it would mean is that if the, the philosophy of the Flash TV show, which is to say the introduction of tachyons as part of the speed force in the Flash TV show was rolled over into Doomsday Clock, or if it was always going to be in a Doomsday Clock and they were just waiting for it to be, to be done in the TV show first, it would make perfect sense because what it would mean is that in this moment when Superman goes to face off against Dr. Manhattan, this suddenly a rift in the speed force opens and all the speedsters that we haven't seen come pouring out, right? So here comes Max Mercury, here comes Jay Garrick, here comes all these different speedsters that we've been waiting to see return who basically hop back up again and they all face off against Dr. Manhattan alongside Superman, possibly even give him the power of the Flash, you know, allow him to basically tap into the speed force itself and they all end up defeating Dr. Manhattan. It would be an amazing idea and it'd be an amazing concept. And there's precedence for this, right? There's precedence for the idea of, of comic books postponing a story and then waiting for a TV show to do it, right? I.e. the death of Superman. The idea was that when Superman died in, in the early 1990s, that was not originally going to happen. What was originally going to happen is Superman was going to marry Lois Lane in the comic books. But this TV show, The Adventures of Lois and Clark, they were the ones who were supposed to do it first, right? Warner Brothers was like, no, 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 no. The TV show is going to do it first. Then you guys can do it in the comics. And so they had to postpone the marriage in the comics, which they did after Superman died. Then the two of them got married. Uh, and so as a result of that, there's precedence for this, right? There's 
precedence for a TV show introducing a concept, or, or, or at least, you know, a concept possibly being introduced in the comics, but being postponed in the comics so it can be introduced in a TV show and then be reflected in the comics. Uh, there's precedence for that, right? So this works. This, this would actually, actually be a really, really, really amazing thing. <laughs> I would love it if that were the case. If all the various speedsters made their return, I would absolutely love that. But what I want to do here, you know, kind of getting into the second half of our show, you know, what I want to do here, I want to transition away from...